Hello YouTube, and welcome to the last episode of this cycle of the educated barbarian. In part one, we discussed faith and its importance in the old wood, how it civilized men. Then in part two, we discussed the death of God, what happened to this religion that used to be a key component of civilization and that then went away, the reasons why it was as such. And then in part three, we also spoke about what happened afterwards. What is a wood without God? Is it a wood without religion? Is it a wood without dogma or cult? Not at all. We have seen instead that the goal, the, the God of the Old Testament, of the New Testament even, had been replaced by the God of modernity. And that leads us to this fourth part. The fourth part in which Nietzsche discusses the decline of the European man. Now, the reason why we're going to focus on European men in particular is because you have to keep in mind that Nietzsche is a European philosopher. So all of his ideologies and examples are based on the old continent. And therefore, it's super relevant and it's super important that we localize the thoughts that we're going to share today. If you are European, I hope you don't feel attacked because just like with any other person that actually had the courage to click on that type of video, for the people who are deeply religious, for example, I hope it's going to make you see the light because by the end of this episode, I think you're going to have a better understanding of your condition as a man who was born in Europe and also a better view, a global view of what happened to your people because Nietzsche was alive at a time where he was able to foresee the decline and the destruction of a people that once were all powerful and nowadays have pretty much went down the gutter to a point that if we were able to actually go back in time, we wouldn't even be recognizable by our ancestors. So let's start discussing it today. As you understand, I hope this cycle was about religion. So the questioning that we're going to have to actually answer today is also based around that question. Since the decline of men in Europe is directly linked to the decline of religion, according to Nietzsche again. In the view of the author, philosophy is the art of organizing concepts for the furtherment of mankind, which is the reason why he believed that it was up to philosophers to answer such epineous questions, such as the one of the decline of mankind. And on the same page, in a sense, as a continuation of that logic, he also discussed in length about the powers of psychology, but also religion. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. Nietzsche wasn't anti-religion, I've said it previously. What he was, however, is someone who looked at, at religion as a system that was created by men to organize men and not as something divine. In a sense, he lacked that faith. One could maybe even believe that he was jealous of that faith because he was simply not able to access it because of the spirit of the race. He was German and therefore he was of a people that didn't have the ability to just engage themselves entirely with the, the, the big question, the big adoration of a God. And therefore, for him, in his eyes, religion was just another means of organizing concepts for the fulfillment of mankind. In a sense, it served the exact same purpose as philosophy. And therefore, it is more seen as a civilizational tool rather than something that is purely spiritual. Because to him, it's that part that's the most interesting. If you get scooped in and you get, in a sense, entangled with the idea of religion as something that is purely an ability to access a higher spiritual mindset, you are going to lose sight of what it does on the ground because religion has a direct correlation with real life. Look at politics. Look at how intertwined religion and politics was back in the days in Europe. Look at how much it's still connected in certain countries like Muslim countries, for example, where their political regime are, con are connected with the text, with Sharia law, for example. I'm not going to go too deep into that, but it's just a way to show to you that Nietzsche was correct in that sense. Religion was always something that had a direct influence on the way men evolved. So evolution is a biological process that is also influenced in terms of behavior, not in terms of DNA, by the set of cultural standards we apply. And religion is one of them. So we could call religion mankind's refinery. Very important point to understand as well. 
in the old age with old faith, what Nietzsche used to call the pre-moral epoch, there there need to be there needed to be uh, there used sorry there used to be a need for moral guidance because it's what we can call the barbarian ages where the 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 law of the strongest was always applied might made right on a daily basis and the issue is that this also meant that we are not much better than just animals so at some point there needed to be the creation of a tool that could allow for societies to exist. Because in a society where everyone is going to rob each other or kill each other or steal each other's wives, you quickly understand that this is no society. It's just tribes of individuals that are going to kill one another for gain. So we agreed as a people to put away the barbarian act for the safety of the group. And we needed something as a guideline that was going to actually be embraced by the group. And that was religion. So practices like ascetism and puritanism are seen as Nietzsche as, in a sense, and that's paradoxical, necessary evil. He was not an anarchist. He didn't want to do away with religion. He perfectly understood what it did. But the issue is that it went too far. We saw in part three that, first and foremost, it seemed that religion was just doomed to fail and to disappear and to devolve into atheism, which is a subpar version of religion. But worse than that, even if that never had happened, the very mindset and attempt at restraining the might of man, the portions, the natural portions of man, was also doomed to derail at some point. And that is what led to the decline of the European men that we're going to be discussing today. So, since religion was always used by leaders of the world to strengthen their authority and to control people, we can also assess that for the most part, it was also never done in earnest. That's another issue that Nietzsche had with religion. I believe that what he detested the most was the fact that the, the moralist preachers of this world, for the most part, were not preaching their moral guidance and values to be able to make the world a better place. They did it to control the masses and to make sure that everyone was going to stay in their rank and everything was going to stay in order. I believe that if people were outright and outspoken with that, Nietzsche would have actually been pro-religion outright. But the issue is that it's the deception that he actually despised so much. And he, he despised that, uh, that deception back in his days. Nowadays, I think it's even more present. It's even more, in a sense, permanent because it has just been completely accepted by the common folk. It's the reason why, again, no one questions morality, even people who are not religious at all. So, uh, that is also the logic of the king, right? We discussed it in part one, that back in the days, the king, the knight, all of these very powerful men, they would embrace faith first and foremost as a test of their own strength. They wanted to be able to see what was all about that God figure, that thing that was greater than them. And so, they humiliated themselves, again, as a form of hubris, to prove to themselves that even in their all-powerful state, they still had the ability to submit to someone else willingly. And that was that suicide of reason that was spoken about. But that quickly just disintegrated because this willingness was quickly replaced by the realization that if those said kings managed to put that same idea in the head of the common folk, it was an incredibly potent tool to manipulate said people. And at some point, this also meant that they themselves stopped being manipulated because they stopped respecting God. They just saw God as a tool. And that is when God died. Nowadays, you have noticed that we've moved away from that. Most governments in Europe, for example, don't use God to manipulate people. They've replaced that by other tools of brainwashing or other tools of mass organization, like science, for example, that we spoke about in part three. So, if we are to, if we are to accept that, and we are to accept that the earnest value of religion had disappeared for the most part and was mostly used for authority, we can also state that men who possess independence but still choose to live a contemplative existence found something else in religion. Because if you're not going to use religion for your own sake, for your own self-humiliation, to access a higher spiritual state of mind, or if you're not going to use it for authority, then what exactly could be the first choice? Well, that is when we enter the realm of the historical reading of religion by Nietzsche. Now, 
It's something I'm personally not very versed in, so I'm just going to take his vote at face value. We're going to look at it in a sense as an observation of society and not necessarily as something that is absolutely correct. It's just an allegory of sort. So for him, those men with independence that still, again, lived that contemplative existence far away from the powers of politics found in religion a welcome retreat from it. So for him, this was a different caste of man, the type of man that perfectly understood the powers of religion so they could use it for their own gains, but also understood that if they completely relinquished the spiritual, they would also lose. See, that's what I just spoke about. It's the difference between that king that is in it only for the spiritual and the king that is in it only for the authority. There is that middle ground. And the middle ground, according to Nietzsche, is the Brahmins. So the Brahmins are a caste of Indian people, and they were the priest class. So they were the ones that were, again, entangled with the figure of God. And you could tell me, okay, well, this doesn't that mean that by default, they have to be one or the other. They have to be either in it for authority or just as spiritual priests that are just not going to partake in politics. But that is where they managed to actually come up with a solution that was quite smart and one that Nietzsche actually pointed out because to him, these people, these Brahmins, were of a higher stature, of a higher nature. And therefore, they also understood that, that there was a way to still keep their religion as a welcome retreat from what he calls the noise and trouble of managing grosser affairs while at the same time not relinquishing the power because, and again, my apologies if this is historically inaccurate, the Brahmins were in control, meaning that they were the ruling class as well as the spiritual class, which is paradoxical because if you look at Europe, the two tended to be disconnected for the most part, or if they were connected, there was a balance of power, meaning that if you look at Europe, for example, the priest or the pope wasn't the king. He was the chief of, of Christendom, for example, but he wasn't ruling countries. He had to associate with the king. The Brahmins, however, had a much stricter control on political affairs because they were men of superior spirituality that managed to organize a decisional system that secured kings for the people while their sentiments prompted them to keep apart and outside as men with a higher and regal mission. So they understood the necessity to control the power, but at the same time, they wanted nothing to do with it because they perceived the corrupting influence of political power and assertiveness and authority, and they wanted nothing to do with that because they saw what was going to lead them. It was going to lead them towards a sort of atheism in a sense because you become disillusioned. You start seeing God for what it is or what you made him into, which is a tool to gain power. And so how exactly can you now use it to access a spiritual awakening? Well, it's absolutely impossible. In a sense, the Brahmins were the aristocrats of India, meaning that they had a detestation for that type of gross labor. They saw politics as that type of labor and therefore they would have much rather have their puppets do the work and that puppet was usually the king's that they selected for the people. So the king wasn't a Brahmin for the most part, for what I understand, but he was someone that worked under the Brahmins. And that is quite smart. That is, in a sense, the equivalent of if the Pope had entire control over the kings of Italy, France, Sweden, etc., etc. For the most part, it's not what happened in Europe. The power was, in a sense, spread. It was, it was shared. And there were also conflicts between the kings and the popes. Now, this also speaks, in a sense, to social economical dynamics, because if we are going to accept the fact that these Brahmins, these higher status men, benefited from religion, this also means that this same religion has an impact across the classes. Everyone in society who lives in a country that's religious is impacted by religion. And this is when we start getting into the discussion of the decline of the European man, because we spoke about kings and pops, but all of these are very elevated figures. These are not the common folks. What about the common folks? What happened to the common folk that he started to suffer from this entire state of affairs? Well, you see, these very same social economical dynamics 
in a sense, were connected to religion because religion, and that's important to keep in mind because I know that many people who are into the entire class warfare discussion despise religion. Just look at the Russian Revolution. They targeted Jewish and Christian uh, communities first and foremost because they perceived it as a threat to their future. But in reality, and that's another proof that Nietzsche didn't hate religion, religion also provides class mobility to some of its subjects, even though they are not of a higher class, because it functioned as an incentive to aspire to higher intellectuality and to experience the sentiments of authoritative self-control, of silence and of solitude. Very key component, I believe, of understanding religion again as a tool to organize the fundament of mankind. If we take Christianity, for example, what does it mean in this case? Well, take someone who's an uneducated peasant. He would have never had access to books for the most part because he's not getting educated. He's not going to class. Now you bring the Bible into his house. Now he has to learn how to read first and foremost. Then he has to decipher the Bible that is written in allegories. That is a powerful tool of intellectualization, of educating the masses. And from there, he can aspire to a higher intellectuality and spirituality. The Bible is, in a sense, the doors that open and pave the way to other books. Interesting when you consider the fact that the Bible is seen as the one and only book. It's the most important book for Christians. It's the most sold book in the entire world, etc. Many would tell you the Bible is the end of intelligence because it's the one book and then you stop reading because everything is in the Bible. But that's not true. Most well-read authors, most of the most influential authors of all times, including philosophers, read the Bible and their books are direct connections with the Bible. So something to keep in mind, it worked for authors. It also worked for the average peasant. On top of that, religion would teach that very same person sentiments of introspection, like self-control. Self-control that is not a given, mind you, because we are one of the only species of this planet that actually masters self-control, meaning that it's an art. It's something that we seek, and you recognize a degenerate in that they refuse to actually control themselves, which also means that they are much closer to animal than they are to human. It's one of the tools that made us elevate ourselves above the station of just mammal. That is also something that religion did a fair share of. If you remember part one, all of these knights, all of these kings, who used to be barbarians, what turned them into civilized gentlemen? What turned the guy who used to rape and murder and pillage on, in the 11th century in France into le bourgeois gentilhomme, into a man who is refined, who is courteous, who is chivalrous? Is it magic? Is it progress? Is it that just because the years passed, we somehow lost all of that animality that we used to have? No, it's the civilizational work that religion put into place, again, to make society a better environment for life to actually further itself. So all of that started with very good intentions. It was doing its job at the start. It was functioning very well because the populace was also benefiting from religion. It wasn't just the king. So it truly did, back in the day, serve as a tool for mankind to improve itself. Religion, for the common person, even the person that wasn't of very high stature, used to provide contentness with their lot and condition via ennoblement of obedience. Incredible. I think that this is the type of things that you, you listen to and you learn and you're like, okay, that makes so much sense. If you're going to have a society with classes, which is just natural because nature classifies, nature creates hierarchies. We are still animals. We created the same anarchy with the best at the top and the suckers at the bottom. How do you make it so that even the ones that are going to suffer the most are going to be okay with their lot? How do you make it so that someone is going to accept their stature as a peasant or as like a, a lower caste in India and look at the Brahmins and think, okay, this is perfectly acceptable and I don't wish to revolt against that? Well, you create a religion, a system that is going to provide them with content, something that is going to make them okay with their condition. And how do you do that? Well, you present obedience as a value. You present obeying the strong 
someone who is higher than you as someone which, which is good. Because keep in mind that this is what you do as a religious man. You look at God and you say, okay, God is a being higher than me. So by nature, I must be different and I must bow the knee. Take that same logic, apply it to society. It's the same. Now you have a system where the pyramid is not going to be seen as oppressive. Remember that the reason why nowadays we have these discussions of class warfare is because we did away with that. In a sense, we took away the veil. And now people look at these hierarchies and they say, well, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with my condition as a lower being. This must be unjust because we're all equal. We must burn down the pyramid or even worse, we must invert it. We must turn it on its head. The lower will be the higher, etc., etc. All of that is a result of a system based on social hierarchies that has done away with the containment procedure, in a sense, that used to make that system acceptable to the common folk. All of that was done away with. That son, the son of religion, because God is connected to the son to, for a reason. The son is making your day better. The son is making this life acceptable. That son that used to justify the suffering on earth was gone. Because Christianity, and most religions, by the way, walk in trying to make suffering look acceptable. It tells you that in suffering and in pain, there is progression. There is something greater. You can elevate yourself through pain, in a sense. It makes mortification acceptable. A mortification you didn't choose. You are born in this world. You're going to suffer. Religion was there to tell you it's okay. It's a natural part of life. Do away with religion. Does pain go away? No, because pain is natural. But look at what it did to our society. Look at modern people. They complain all the time. This is too painful. I don't want to work. I don't want to have to do this. Why? They don't have a reason for that suffering anymore. So now suffering is only pain. Pain without meaning. Just like, again, morality now has no meaning. We did away with meaning when we got away from God. And so all of that now is just... The leftovers. It's the leftovers of a word that used to have something like a crutch. It was something that was blocking the valve and we did away with that. And that thing was Christianity for Europe. And now I'm going to quote Nietzsche and I hope that it's going to convince you once and for, more, for, uh, once and for all that he did actually believe that it was an important part of the civilization. There is nothing more admirable in Christianity than the art of teaching the lowest to elevate themselves to a higher order of things and to retain their satisfaction with the actual world in which, in which they find it difficult to live. A necessary difficulty. The world is a difficult place. You're not going to be top dog all the time. Religion used to tell you it was okay, that it was a way to elevate yourself. Nowadays, this same pain and suffering is still there. That necessary difficulty is still there, but it's not seen as acceptable anymore because it is seen as inescapable and it is seen as in unjust. It's the reason why people nowadays call it oppression because they think someone else is doing, them to, doing it to them. Sometimes it's correct, but for the most part, it's not. It's just nature. They are the bottom bitch. The bottom bitch suffers. And that is the truth. Now, this is what leads us to what religion has become, because it's not like Europe is not religious anymore. And in a sense, we discussed in part three, we still have the remnants of religion. There's still morality. So how come we, we, how come we deteriorate it so fast? Well, it's because we have modified the way religion used to work. We used to have a system and we, we glitched it. We modified the code and now it does something else. You see, according to Nietzsche, the danger resides in religions that do not operate as educational and disciplinary mediums, but as paramount rules. When they wish to be the final end instead of a mean along other means. And now we're pointing and we're touching the moment when, when according to Nietzsche, religion went astray. You see, religion was supposed to restrain the strength of man and to turn him into a civilized being. But if we look at this formula and equation, we also understand that there is a finite resource that is going to run out eventually. And then what? If you're going to restrain the strength of man, what happens when, when man runs out of strength? Do we do away with the restraint? 
No, because now the machine is out of control. It's like an AI created that is going to continuously do its job. So if it cannot restrain strength anymore, it's going to continue pushing men towards the same direction, which is weakness. That is what I call the church of weakness. It's why if you look at Christianity a thousand years ago and what it is today, it's unrecognizable. And the type of men and women it produces is also entirely different because it stopped operating as a disciplinary medium and now it's just rules to live your life with or let rule your life by that mean nothing because they are not a mean to an end, they are just the final end. They don't really have a meaning anymore. And on top of that, they have become the sole mean since, again, religion was supposed to be one way, one way only to organize society, not the only way. If it becomes the only way, then it also loses purpose. And that is the absolutism of church. That is when the thing started to go astray. And that is what gave birth, again, to atheism because religion went too far. But I'm not going to cover that again. It was in part three. Now, when we get to that point, you stop <coughs> being able to utilize religion for what it used to be. Because religion used to be, again, something to, in a sense, corrode strength to make it now acceptable. But it wasn't supposed to do away with strength. So it was a religion for strong people. But now all of your people are weak. Again, it's the slave insurrection. The slaves, the, the, the plebeians have taken over and they cannot stand suffering. So they're not going to follow your religion. They're going to make it into something else. And they have done that. So now... We have a religion that is not giving justification for the suffering of the infirm. It's not telling people that they're suffering that it's just. Instead, it seeks to preserve the suffering and the sufferer entirely, opening, opening up the path to resentment towards the successful cases. Okay, it sounds complicated. It's not. What does it mean exactly here? You see, again, there used to be a time when there were downtrodden people. You can call them slaves, even if you will. Religion made their life bearable because it told them that what their suffering was doing is it was making them a better person. And on top of that, it was showing them that their suffering was just. It was in the natural order of things. But at some point, religion moved away from that. That cruel God was replaced by a God of love. And a God of love surely cannot punish his children. It's the reason why nowadays you'll have people who think they're going to debunk Christianity who are going to tell you, hey, if God is real, then how come people suffer? How come children die in Africa? Well, you know why? It's because God is not supposed to keep you alive. God is not supposed to make your life fluffy and pink. That's not his job. That's the job of the plastic God that Christians created. But that's not a God. That's a fabrication of modernity. But that type of subtlety is lost on these people. So now... They're left in a situation where they simply cannot accept suffering. It's not acceptable, but people still suffer. So what do you say to these people? What is your new religion, your new system is going to do to make it okay to organize it? Well, you're going to, again, flip the script. You're going to look at the weak and you're going to tell him that he's perfect the way he is. He shouldn't change. And actually, you're going to start demonizing strength. You're going to point out strength and say strength is the reason why the weak suffers. It's not natural. It's all very unjust. And by doing that, you preserve the weakling. You preserve the infirm entirely. And you open up the path, as I said, to resentment towards the people that you have now created as the perpetrators. Look at all of the people nowadays that if you tell them, hey, how's your life doing? They'll tell you, oh, it sucks because of this, because of that. It's the fault of the rich. It's the fault of black people, of white people, the Jewish people. Why? Because the path has been opened. Now people suffer and they're not just going to accept the suffering. They're going, so if they don't accept it, then they look for a source because if someone does something wrong to you, they're going to try and find the person to make it stop. There used to be no need for that because pain was accepted. So it was just natural. Now it's not natural anymore. Pain is man-made and anything man-made can actually be seen as a punishment by a person towards your own person. And that is entirely unacceptable. So that is the, in a sense, the conclusion of the slave insur insurrection. It has created the society that we live in nowadays. Wow, that was scary. <clears throat> Now, outcomes irrationality is no longer seen as a part of nature, 
but as an injustice. So for example, someone is born taller than you, it used to be just part of life. Nowadays, you have people who are going to complain about it, when in reality, it was just part of nature. It's not an injustice. But because we have accepted that, we have also allowed people to hunt to extinction that type of injustice, which leads also to the rarification of greatness while the surplus of failure is preserved. It's what I call soil death. And this is exactly when we start actually understanding the reason why men have declined in Europe. You now live in a culture that hates strength, hates pain, and prioritize the weaklings and tell them that it's okay to be weak. What exactly is going to happen next? You have created the perfect soil to grow shitty ass plants. You will not grow proper crop in this ground, but it's because the ground itself is not good. It's not the nature of the seed. It's where the seed actually grows. There are no nutrients in that ground in particular. And now we have what Nietzsche calls a surplus of failure. Because if we're going to look at greatness as something oppressive, then we're going to hunt it. Most people are not going to be motivated to be great. So mediocrity is going to become the norm. It's going to become our new culture. Greatness is going to become rarer and rarer, meaning also that because the rare and the exceptional are in even shoulder older, it's even easier to point them out and to say, oh, look, it's him. Well, yeah, now because there's almost, there's almost no one left. So the scapegoat has become the exceptional. The one that used to rule society, that used to be an example, has now become a demon in the eyes of most people. Again, look at the Western world and look at how much people hate the rich. Eat the rich. Why do people say that? Part of it is because they perceive that there is some injustice in the system. I'm not going to take that away from them. But it's deeper. It's also a natural instinct. But it's a perverse instinct. You look at the rich, it's someone who did better in life than you, and you're going to hate that. Keeping in mind also that these people are hypocrites, because if you made them rich tomorrow, would they eat themselves? Would they give away their money? No, they would accept that newfound fortune. They would join the ranks of the super rich. They would accept that new status, and they would say, you know what? Fuck the poor. But since they are not rich right now, they are going to direct their frustration with their status in life, towards these people, and that's, that's Europe. Europe, North America, Canada, countries that I, have, I know because I've been there, and this is the average man. The average man behaves exactly like that. We are talking right now about the average European man. I'm not even going to get started on French men because I think that if there is one country in the world where this in particular is prevalent, it's France. The amount of detestation for greatness and success in my country makes me sick. Someone succeeds, the first thing you're going to hear from other men is, oh, he cheated, or he's not virtuous, he doesn't deserve it. Why? There are this. There are seeds that grew in a soil that was devoid of greatness. And therefore, when they see someone else that made it, they think, oh, it's unjust. It's impossible this person made it by legitimate means because I couldn't. Why? Because they cannot accept the national, the, the rational and natural irrationality of outcomes that in reality is not irrational at all. It's just that the people that put in the most work are going to just make it. I know that it's a mindset that is hated nowadays. It's the pull yourself by the bootstraps mindset, but it works. And now we see finally what religion has become. Religion for suffering becomes religion for sufferers. And that is where all of the distinction is. If you understand this, you understand everything. I just summed up the four episodes and Nietzsche's ideas regarding religion in these terms. It used to be that religion was for suffering. Nowadays, it's for sufferers. It used to give a meaning to suffering. Now, it just welcomes people who suffer and gives them a house, but doesn't give them a way out of it. Therefore, it also stops recognizing hurt as a growing pain, as I already explained, and instead operates in favor of those who suffer from life as from a disease. And they would fain treat every other experience of life as false and impossible. It's what I just told you about. Someone who suffers, try it, please, for the love of God, try it. Someone who suffers, go see them and say, hey, it's for your own good. Or you're going to get greater out of it. You know what they're going to do? 
they are going to direct their frustration towards you because now you become a demon. How dare you tell them that their pain is going to make you better? It's again, the people who don't understand squat at, of religion or Christianity who, when someone says, oh, it's, it's, it's God's will, or you have the disease, it's God's will, and they're like, well, why would God will that? He didn't. I saw it's nature. You cut that disease. What do you want me to tell you? There's only one way forward to accept it, take the suffering and get better. But if you refuse, you're just going to see the disease as a punishment. Again, a punishment from whom? Because so many atheists think like this. They have a fatalist, deterministic view of the world. But who is causing all of your disabilities? Who is causing all of your suffering? God? Or nature, because whether you give one or the other answer, you must also accept that that suffering came from somewhere. It's not random. And if it's not random, you have to accept that it has an influence on you. Now, it might be faceless. I'm not saying that all suffering has a meaning, but we give it meaning. And that's the most important part. Nowadays, again, since the meaning is gone entirely, people just suffer from life. How many people do you know complain about being alive? Unironically, how is it possible? How did we get there? There used to be a time where people were fighting every day to stay alive, to put food in their, in their bellies. Nowadays, we don't. Why? Modernity. There's no meaning anymore. And on top of that, we now have a society that keeps people alive. So you used to suffer to be able to stay alive. Now the suffering is mostly gone and you're still alive. You don't really want to be because there's no challenge now. There's no struggle. And yet you will notice that these people are also the ones that complain the most. Why? Because any amount of suffering is intolerable to them because they don't know what it is anymore. It's a foreign entity that enters their body like a disease again, and they don't want that. And therefore, they also again perceive other type, types of life, all types of perceivable understanding of pain as just fascist. It's fascist to say that pain is going to make you grow. As a result, again, that type of religion for sufferers that I call a religion of weakness standardizes lowest denominators because it gives these people free reign to exist and it justifies their existence. It tells them you are the moral, you are the one in the right. Anyone who lives as someone who seeks strength, for example, is a moral. And that is because weakness courts create their own members. By encouraging stagnation, the refusal of pain, modern religions, including atheism and scientism, have demonized will to power while asserting will to survival as true morality. This part is the most important part of the entire cycle based on religion. If you get this, your eyes are going to be open. What it means here is simple. That will to power, that is at the key of everything, it's at the center of everything in life, according to Nietzsche, is still there, but it has been replaced by the will to survival. See, nowadays, if you seek power, you're seen as a bad person. You must only try to survive. But that itself is will to power because there is no such thing as will to survival. And this is when we get into the discussion of how exactly these people took over. Because you could tell me, NH, if the powerful were in position, how did the slaves manage to over overthrow them? Well, it's very simple. What they did is this. They started to claim that their will was the true will of morality and therefore their were the good people and they started to normalize it. Many people embraced it to be good. How many people nowadays you will see humiliate themselves or check their privileges or they're going to just relinquish their past. Why? It's a glorious past. It's a past of greatness. They might have a very high standing of society, but they're just not going to embrace it outright. Why? Because they have bought into the idea that being high class, being someone with a lot of will to power was bad. You must only survive. But paradoxically, the same that only survive exert their will to power because they finally get to dominate the strong without having to be strong themselves. Because being strong is pain. They don't want pain, but they still want strength. And so they came up with this manigance. That is the slave insurrection. That is the way it worked. Because in the heart of every strong man is the sympathy towards the weak. And the weak can and will abuse it if you let them. If you start to believe that their position as a weakling is unjust, if they can convince you 
that it's unjust, you're going to start buying onto the idea that your position as a superior is also unjust. And now they want, because they injected you with the poison. Now you are not legitimate anymore. Now you must bow down to them. Look at society nowadays. It's exactly what happened. It's that flipping of the pyramid I was talking about. And because ancient faith, as we've spoken about in part one, as a disciplinary mean was seen as cruel, it was replaced by man-made organizational systems that replaced spirituality by la religion de la souffrance humaine, the religion of human suffering. I told you, society cannot do away with these systems to organize it. It has to continue on that path. So what does it do once religion, the old faith, is done away with? Well, it replaced it by this. It's will to power that was, that was dashed, replaced by will to survival that Nietzsche again calls la religion de la souffrance humaine, with mass appeal to the masses. Tell me, which type of religion do you think is, go is going to do the best? One that preaches strength, accepts suffering as something that is natural and part of life, or one that is going to demonize suffering and make weaklings for better without having to put any efforts in? Maybe in the past it was the first one because there was a surplus in Europe, for example, of strong wills. But nowadays there's only limp wristed bastards. And therefore, what is left? Well, a people, a mass of people that are going to buy massively into the type of ideology because it is going to help them cope. It's perfectly in line with who they are. Again, if you tell a slave, hey, you are a slave because that's the way you're born and you're just not good enough to not be a slave. Or if you tell him, hey, your condition as a slave is unjust. And even worse than that, you are actually the true moral one. And the people that enslaved you, even though they're stronger than you because you're their slave, are the meanies in the story. You are the closest to God. Which one is the slave going to pick? He's going to pick the ideology that is already aligned with his identity. Which, and this is key, keeps him a slave. Because now he bought into his own identity. He reinforces the identity. It's the same in Europe. The court of weakness keeps men weak. Because now it's okay to be weak. So why would you struggle? But if you come up with a religion that says, no, weakness is unacceptable. Here, take some suffering and become strong. That creates strong men. So in a sense, weakness courts do create their own members. It's like a perpetual movement that just makes it so that the decline is unstoppable. It just keeps happening. Because in doing so, that decline, that system that was put in place as, a, again, a mechanism of decline, shattered the strong, spoiled great hopes, cast suspicion on beauty, broke down anything autonomous, manly and conquering into uncertainty and self-destruction inverting all love of the earthly into hatred of the earth. There is no need for explanation as to what I just said. I think it is self-evident. And all of that culminates in Nietzsche's own words by the sublime abortion of man. This is how you turn man into an untermensch. It's that very system. It's that very mechanism. You start by breaking down the strong, you destroy the aristocracy, you destroy the ones that rule because they were born stronger or they struggle to become stronger. You point them out as the evil ones, as the demons. And in a sense, by doing that, you poison the well because you make it so that other people, all of the, the mediocre ones, are not going to want to actually become that. Who will want to become part of the aristocracy, part of the elite, if the elite now are seen out as bad people? No one. That's that new morality again I was speaking about. You also cast suspicion on beauty. Hello, modern world. Look at this place we live in. Well, beauty is seen as something almost suspicious. Like there's something bad in it. It's not okay to be too beautiful. Walking on your body is seen as vain. Where is that coming from? It's this. It's the court of weakness all over again. Look at what happened to Hart. Nietzsche predicted the destruction of illustrative, of in a sense, figurative art replaced by the contemporary garbage modern art that we have nowadays. That is devoid of beauty and devoid of meaning because in beauty there is true meaning. You also again break down anything autonomous. You disallow humans to exist by themselves. You take away their independence. You force them to live as groups. Again, part of the organization of society. What do governments want the most? They want you to depend on them. How do you do that? 
You take away the independence of the average citizen. You force them to rely on systems he cannot exist without, even though he used to be able to in the past. Then you tell him that without these systems, he would die, he would perish. And just like that, you create a blob. You create an untermatch because he bought into it. Now his identity is tied to the government. He cannot function without the government. He starts thinking that without the government, his life is over. But it's the other way around. Without you, the government is over. That's a rant for another day, but it's also part of the understanding of political organization tied to religion that was part of Nietzschean philosophy and that is so important. And so, again, all of that leads to the abortion of man. Man is not a man anymore. This work of destruction that is diagnosed, again, mainly in Europe, but visible everywhere, and it's especially true nowadays, I want to apologize, even though it's not my fault, for what westernization has done to the world. We have taken all of the garbage of America and Europe, Western Europe especially, and we imported that. When I see people of third world countries that are buying into that podium, I'm thinking, man, you could have been so great. But for some reason, you are trying to be copycats of us and you don't realize what we've become. The decline of European men is going to be the decline of every other country that is going to buy into that system of organization. If no one is smart enough to understand the poison in it. Now, I'm not going to cite countries. Maybe you guys in the comments are going to just pipe up. Some countries have... They sniffed it and they're like, uh-uh. Uh -uh. We see what's coming with all of your bullshit and your democracy and all of that Western value stuff. And we don't like what you've become. So we're not going to allow it to happen to ourselves. There is great hope in these people. They have all the problems to deal with, but at least they're not going to fall for that. And that's very important. Now, that again, that destruction, that work of destruction, and this is true. Even if you don't believe in God, I, I think you're going to agree with that, is an affront to God himself, Right? Even if you just accept God as nature, do you think that whatever created us, even if you just believe in evolution, do you think that's what we are supposed to do? Do you think we're evolved? Or do you think that maybe at some point we reached an apex of evolution and now we're devolving? Because it's, that's my opinion. I think we're devolving. And I know that the modern man doesn't want to hear that. We want to hear that we're so much better than our ancestors. I don't buy that for a second. I think we are doing worst. We are actively going backwards. It's terrible. And we call that progress. Now, it's important that Nietzsche even mentions that because it, it also shows that he believes in the figure of God, at least in the sense of a creator, of a sculptor. And he says that that very sculptor would scarcely recognize his creatures because we are so far from what we used to be. Again, religion was supposed to just temper our strength enough to make us into civilized being, but it went too far. Now we are super civilized and paradoxically, we have returned into barbarians. We went full circle. We're going to discuss that in later parts because the, the barbarian take of the European man is paradoxical. You could tell me, well, I thought we became wimps. Well, no, it's worse than that. We became animals. We returned into animals. But now we are animals that pretend to not have teeth. We'll cover that in the future. Do not worry. But yeah, God won't recognize us anymore because he himself made us after the image of nature's perfection. And nowadays we are as far away from nature as humanly possible. We have destroyed nature as much as possible. We live in cities of cement, of just pure brutalism. We are doing everything in our power to separate ourselves from our creator. Again, man hubris. This is hubris from man because we want to believe that we created ourselves. That is absolutely untrue. Whether you believe in creationism or evolution, you know that's not true. We either come from nature or from God, but we cannot separate ourselves from it. That would be our doom, actually. It has already been our doom. Now, that type of doom, that type of separation, can only be the work of mediocre minds, not visionary enough to fashion men as artists or allow the law of thousandfold failures to exist and determine to obliterate ranks, gradations, and separations. These are the architects of the destruction and the decline of the European man. It's the people that put these systems in place. You can say it's the politicians, but at the end of the day, we vote for them to an extent. So it's us as a whole. We fell for that trap entirely. And we have become the mediocre minds that we were just dest destined to be shaped and molded into. We are, in a sense, 
what was once a great statue that could have been improved because Nietzsche never says that man had reached his apex, but now we're just destroying the statue. This is the age of deconstruction that we have now entered. And we again call that progress, where in reality, look at this wood. We are not making any progress anymore. We're breaking down things from the past. That is not progress. If I take a paint, a, a bucket of, of pink paint, and I toss it onto a beautiful painting, is it progress? I modified the painting, but it's not progress. It's active, it's active regression. And it's also active failure in a sense, because we have refused the law of failure to exist. Failure is pain, pain is unacceptable, we are going to do away with it, and just like that, you take away the ability of man to actually progress. You also look at ranks and gradation, things that are natural, you call them unjust, you do away with them, you refuse separation, and you say, no, we must all be equal. Equal in what? Mediocrity. It's why Nietzsche detested equality, it's because he perceived it for what it was. It's not equality in greatness, it's not, oh, we're all going to suffer and become great, no. It's we're all going to be mediocre pieces of shit that are dependent on a system. That is what happened to us. That is what happened to the European man. And I'm going to closure this episode and this cycle focused on religion with this quote. Such men, with their equality before God, have swayed the destiny of Europe until at last a dwarfed, almost ludicrous species has been produced, a gregarious animal, mediocre, the European of today. This was back in Nietzsche's time. Look at us today. If you're European, please be honest with yourself. Look at the men around you. Are you telling me that these are men? Are you telling me they are going to lead us towards a great destiny? They won't. They won't and you know it. So I hope that if you are part of that group, like I am, I'm a European man, you're going to realize what happened to you if you are caught into that cycle, break away from it. And if you're not, if you emancipated yourself from that poison, I hope it's going to open your eyes to the systems. It's going to make you more cognizant. If you are not from Europe and you're from a culture of ancient faith that has still managed to retain some of that value, be aware of what happened to your brothers and maybe try to prevent it in yourself and the people you love. And for those of you who, again, had the bravery and the courage to click on these videos, even though you're religious, even though you knew I was going to criticize religion based on the work of Nietzsche, I salute you because I know one thing. If you are a man of faith, at the end of these videos, your faith was only solidified. It did not make you believe that God didn't exist. There was no doubt in your mind. At no point did your, did your faith actually waver. If anything, it is now stronger than ever. And for those that don't have faith, I hope that if you are a so-called atheist, you're going to realize the trap you've fallen into and you're going to be able to regain spirituality even if you're someone like me who doesn't subscribe to religion but that is going to still want to be connected with the creator, with nature and what made you you, what makes us us and what makes us great because we have seen that when we separate ourselves from that, we become again mediocre. Now, I'm going to leave you with that. I will be back in two weeks with more episodes based on Nietzsche, where I'm not done. There are episodes that are going to be focused around women and the opinion of Nietzsche on women. We're going to talk about red pills, all great stuff, because the educated barbarian shall keep going forever. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.